I did. Everybody get a cup of ice. No. Okay, if you just hold on a second, we're going to do a little experiment. Um, we're going to do a little experiment here in a couple minutes. But, um, um, welcome. We are expecting some more folks, but we'll get started here. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Hanley. I am the Opioids Initiatives Program Coordinator here at Jefferson County Public Health. And um, moved from Pennsylvania about a year ago. And I worked in substance use prevention in Pennsylvania for a while, and, and um, for about 14 years. And the past three or four years were spent really working in the area of prevention and intervention around uh, heroin, opioids, prescription drugs, and fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl hit the East Coast a little bit earlier, a few years earlier than it did here in the West Coast. So um, my wife got a job and I followed her. So she had a choice. I was coming. Um, so just some things we're going to cover today, just uh, addiction, what are opioids, MATs, uh, Medicaid assisted treatment, or what we just want to call treatment, methadone, Suboxone, Vivitrol, uh, what does the problem look like in Jefferson County, and then I'm going to give you a handout uh, that you can take with you or email, <coughs> with you, or email to you to, to make sure you have. Uh, speaking of that, uh, there is a sign up sheet, if you don't mind just dropping your name on that, that would be great. Certainly don't need your email or organization, I know where to find it. Um, so this is a small community from Western Pennsylvania called West Middlesex. And uh, while we were looking at the heroin epidemic and some things that were happening, uh, an individual on our coalition was the coroner of, of this county. And he told me, hey, listen, you've got to come on a call with me when we have an overdose. And I thought, well, that's a little, I don't know. I've never experienced that. It's not who I am. I've never experienced that. But he said, well, I want you to see the family. I want you to see how the family reacts to this. Um, they are full of shame. They were full of guilt, and they just apologized. So one night he got a call. Um, I met him here, and he said, do you want to go in and see it? I'm like, oh, OK. So I walked in. They showed me uh, where the individual, mid-30s, um, single male, uh, Caucasian, overdosed on heroin in the bathroom, or um, the heroin in, in his bathroom, walked to his couch, overdosed and died. Um, it had been probably close to 20 hours since it happened, and they called his family, and they weren't coming. They said, we're not going to come. And I thought, what? How, how is that possible? What do you mean they're not going to come? And his friend, who was from a few hours away, his friend in recovery, um, had been worried about him. Drove up from the Pittsburgh area and, and found him. Um, so I thought, what, what exactly happened in this individual's life, in this family's life, throughout this whole ordeal? We know people who struggle with addiction probably burn every bridge imaginable, some of them. Obviously, this happened with this individual. Uh, it turns out a couple of days later, after this, uh, I think it was his grandparents came to um, identify the body and take care of everything, but uh, no parents ever showed. So I sat there and I thought, okay, so what do we want to do? So that's my perspective and where I'm coming from, and, and I really like to focus on the community and what we can do as a community to help. I'm not a doctor. I can't prescribe. Um, I'm not in the medical field. Um, I can't do any of that, but what, what can I do? So we focus and we talk a lot about community, education, awareness, and family. So you may have seen this. Uh, this is, I think it was 2015 or 16. It came from the East Liverpool Police Department, which is a small town in Ohio. They released this picture um, because they were sick of the lack of understanding of what they were dealing with on a daily basis with this heroin epidemic. So um, this is a grandmother in the passenger seat, her boyfriend, and a four-year-old boy in the back. Police saw this car and was hit a school bus. It eventually ended up pulling over. They overdosed on carfentanil, okay, which we'll talk a little bit about here in a minute. Um, the grandma got six months in jail. The driver for reckless driving got a year. Uh, the four-year-old is currently in South Carolina, living with other family, apparently doing well. Um, so I, I couldn't find out any information other than when they were sentenced, the two that were going to treatment. I can't find anything else, so I'm not sure what happened. But, East Liverpool Police Department did this, and it caused a big, big firestorm of issues. And, and, and what do you think one of the issues was? Why do you think the police released this? Any ideas or thoughts? <clears throat> Their reasoning was, hey, we, just want, we need to educate the community what's going on. But here's what happened. 
it increased the stigma associated with addiction. Because can you imagine somebody struggling with an addiction? If they come forward, everyone's going to think of them as these two. Um, so it really caused a lot of problems. I think the police department's heart was in the right place. I really do. Um, but that just means that we have to educate, we have to have empathy, and then we have to do what we can to reduce the stigma associated. Okay, so we're going to do an experiment. Everybody has a, a cup of water, or excuse me, a cup of ice. Um, uh, before you do anything, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to stick your finger in the cup. Make sure your finger's on some ice or in between ice cubes. And then whenever you feel a level of discomfort, anything uncomfortable, raise your other hand. But keep your finger in the ice cube, okay? Because we're going to do something else as your hand is raised. Okay, so if you want to just stick any finger in one of your, your eight digits, go ahead, stick it in, in the cup and make sure that it's on ice, okay? And if you start to feel any level of discomfort, just raise your other hand. So anything unpleasant. That's it. <laughs> Those hands up. Keep your finger in there. I won't keep it in much longer, I promise. <laughs> Keep the hand up, keep the hand up, keep the hand up. Okay, keep the hand up. Keep your finger in there. Good. Few more, few more seconds, I promise. <laughs> Anybody in here giving me a shot here? Yeah, this is for you. So I hope this feel a little bit of discomfort. Um, okay, is, is any of that comfort or that discomfort starting to go away? If it is, put your hand down. Is any of it starting to go away? Put your hand down. Okay, most hands are still up, not everyone's hand. Okay, good. You can take your, your finger out. So, um, well, what I wanted to show you are three different things, and this came from, sorry, Dr. Matthews, Martin Samuels, he's a neurologist, I heard him speak, and, and he did this um, presentation, he's talking a little bit about pain and suffering, and what could have led us to this point. So, nociception, basically, everybody has nociception. So, it is your capacity to sense tissue damage. So, everybody, tissue damage, damage cold, heat, uh, the needle, um, a knife, a pen, anything along those lines. No succession. Everybody can has that in their body. Okay, so um, if we would have uh, probably cut your finger and probably would have had to go another minute or so, uh, some of that feeling might have started to go away. Um, why do you think that would have gone away? What do you think happens when that feeling goes away? Any ideas or thoughts? Sensory input and the brain. Right. Disruption. Was that release dopamine? Absolutely. Very close. Yeah, absolutely. Very close. So, what does it release? An opioid. So, our bodies have opioids. Okay, they're produced naturally. So, um, your body. Oh, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It definitely helps with pain. And our body has opioids that, that they produce. So, an opioid is sent from your brain to that injured area and it starts to, starts to help take away the pain, increase that, that uh, uncomfortable feeling. All right, so what you were feeling, discomfort, pain, okay? So there's uh, no susception, there's pain, and then there's suffering. So if you talk about those three different things, um, suffering is the experience of undergoing pain, hardship, or distress. So uh, suffering, let's focus on that right now. Um, well, first off, if I have pain, say I break a bone, say I break my femur, and I go to the emergency room, um, my body's going to produce opioids right away. That's not really going to help the pain. Okay, it doesn't produce enough. So if I have uh, pain like that, I definitely want the emergency doctor to say, hey, listen, we're going to give you an opioid for a week. We're going to help, we're going to help this uh, manage this pain a little bit better. But one thing that goes, um, kind of forgotten is the suffering part of the opioid issue and the crisis. So we know suffering is pain, hardship, and distress. We talked about pain already. What is some kind of hardship or distress? 
anything that could be happening in, in anyone's life? Any sort of stress, trauma? Anything? Say that again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, death, um, war, poverty, marital discord, mental illness, dissatisfaction at work, anxiety, depression. We haven't even talked about youth trauma. We know what's going on with youth trauma and how affected our youth are nowadays. Um, so these are just different things and different areas of suffering. So um, I coached high school girls basketball for about 16 years. And um, I'll never forget a phone call I got one time from a mom. And she said, hey, my daughter missed school today. What happened at basketball practice? She hurt her wrist. Why didn't anybody call me? I said, why don't you remember her hurting her, her wrist? So I called the athletic trainer and I said, um, did, did so-and-so get hurt? No, never came into my office. So I called the mom back and said, she, here's what we did the final 10 minutes of practice. She participated. She didn't hurt her wrist at practice. So she, her mom had already taken her to the doctor. Um, they already got an opioid. But what was the pain, really? What was the suffering? And, and that's another connection that I might be able to make. As I mentioned, I'm not a doctor. I can't prescribe. But what kind of connection can I make? So if we look at all these different things, what was wrong with her? What was really going on with her? We need to make sure that we're connecting people in treatment, in recovery, to that full continuum of care. So yeah, they might go to an abstinence-based treatment facility and get a bed and stay there for 30 days and get some counseling, but when they come out, what are they really dealing with? So we have to always focus on that suffering aspect and, and how can we in the room in, in our everyday life or work life focus on suffering and make sure that we're helping people who are are dealing with it, not just the pain. Obviously, somebody breaks a bone, kind of know where that pain's coming from. What about back pain, chronic pain? Um, what happens when you go to your doctor and you say you have back pain? Is there ever a conversation about what it's about? Um, how'd that happen? How long has it been going on? Any other questions? We need to maybe uh, hook you up with somebody that you can talk to. So just some suffering uh, things that, um, that we talk about. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about tolerance and dependency and then um, addiction and then I'll move on. But uh, basically tolerance is um, a person's diminished response to a drug. Okay, so there are different types of tolerance levels. There's the short term, the acute. So think of, uh, there are some experimental studies that have been done with cocaine. So somebody uses cocaine, they get that euphoric high, okay, but obviously the blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes up. 40 minutes later, they're given cocaine again. They take cocaine again, so they have twice the amount of cocaine in their system, but they don't get an increased euphoric high. But guess what did double? Their heart rate, their blood pressure. So that's kind of acute tolerance. It builds up really quickly. Chronic tolerance is something you can think of like prescription drugs and opioids. Over maybe a few months, you build that tolerance to prescription drugs. And then um, a learned tolerance is, is pretty interesting. Um, so learned tolerance, uh, we, we think a lot about with somebody who's struggling with alcohol um, addiction. So um, learned tolerance is people who are struggling with alcohol addiction, sometimes they are able to um, appear not intoxicated. Um, maybe they're able to get off their bar stool and walk in a straight line to the bathroom, straight line back, and you never know. Okay, but they practice that. They practice that task, so they're able to do that task. But if you take them out of that environment, say they're going home, they get a DUI, they get pulled over, they were just practicing walking in a straight line to the restroom and back. They can't do it when you change that environment, so they're gonna feel, or feel that sobriety test. So learned tolerance is something too that, that happens and, and occurs. Um, so what happens with tolerance? Um, you're able to, to quit. If you're not able to quit and you want that euphoric high or you become addicted, then you increase your dose. Um, dependency. Uh, dependency is basically a physical condition in which the body has adapted to the presence of a drug. So um, obviously it, it's um, caused by changes in the body as a result of the constant exposure. It is treatable. There's medicated assisted treatment we talked about and talk about. And then of course detox. And detox is just going into a medical detox facility, uh, West Pines here in, in Jefferson County, and detoxing, getting off the drug, help, they'll help you deal with the withdrawal symptoms, maybe give you medication to handle those, and then it typically lasts anywhere to five to seven days, five to 10 days, depending on the individual. 
um, but addiction. So this is the uh, official de 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 definition of addiction, and um, you know why recently in the news you still hear about, well, it's a moral failing. Oh, they chose to do that heroin. You know, those addicts, those junkies, let them die, it doesn't matter. Well, addiction obviously says that this is a disease. It causes changes in the brain. Okay, so addiction is a disease. Um, I like to use the, the phrase um, irrational persistence. Okay, so I heard that once, I thought that makes a lot of sense to somebody like me. Um, I have addiction in the family, um, but you know, I've, I've never experienced it myself. I have friends, I have family, I have all of that who have and, and who have died from addiction, but also who have already recovered from addiction. But it's very irrational if I look at it. It's very irrational persistence. Like people wonder, why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? So um, the other thing I want to talk about before we get into a little bit more detail with that is um, an air warm, warm and obsession. Um, so, um, addiction implies craving or obsession, okay, so um, an earworm, probably all heard of that maybe, a song that gets in your head that you just can't get out of your head, so um, you guys are welcome for this. <laughs> If I'm going to suffer, <laughs> um, but that's an obsession. Did anyone see the movie The Quiet Place with John Krasinski and played Jim on The Office? Did anybody see that movie? Okay, a couple people in the back. Did you see it in the movie theater? See it in the movie theater? What did you notice in the movie theater about that movie? Everybody was quiet. Everybody was so quiet because they pretty much communicate with sign language. Because the, the point of the movie is uh, the um, the creature or the whatever it was um, is attracted to sound only. So if you talk, it can help. It's a great movie, but make sure you see. But it was so funny because I was so obsessed with eating my popcorn that, but you couldn't. <laughs> so whenever there was noise or talking, you heard everybody. I saw people checking their cell phone. I saw people digging in their bags. You hear the ice in the drinks, and then all of a sudden it go quiet. And then everyone went, <laughs> "That was our obsession." Um, but it was um, it was interesting to to hear that. But um, obsession, which our thoughts may lead to acts or compulsions that relieve the obsession, of course, is only temporary. Okay, so um, addiction is not a, a moral weakness. Again, we talk about irrational persistence. Uh, the inability to limit or see, cease substance use um, despite the serious negative consequences. Did, did, did they want this to happen? Did they really, really want this to happen? Of course, they overdosed on carfentanil. They had no idea it was probably in the air when they took. They had no idea. Okay, but they didn't want this. But how strong is the addiction? How much do they want to avoid those withdrawal symptoms? that they just had to take heroin while their four-year-old grandson was in the backseat of that car. Um, so I just want to back up a little bit and talk a little bit about opioids, prescriptions, what are they? Um, prescription opioids, um, so on the street, uh, they have different names, Happy Pills, Hillbilly Heroin, OC, Oxy Perks, Bikes. Um, so different types of opioids are oxycodone. That's a picture of oxycotton, which you're probably familiar with. Uh, anybody know how much oxycotton has made? Oxycotton alone. <coughs> right now, $35 billion, $35 billion, and if you want to know why pharmacy companies are being sued, and Jefferson County is suing pharmacy companies, if you want to know why they're being sued, and losing, and dish out money to states, um, look no further to what Purdue Pharma did with Oxycontin, how it marketed it to prescribers and physicians, look no further than that, guess who just created a treatment, medicated sister treatment version of Suboxone? For your farm. For two farm. Um, so, uh, whether that actually takes off, it's really interesting now because people aren't buying into this. There's already some on. We already have it. So, people aren't buying into this, so it'd be interesting to see how that, where that leads. But basically, opioids, they attach it to some receptors on the brain. It's a perfect fit to receptors in the brain. They release dopamine, which is our reward center of pleasure. Um, 
and then they of course have the euphoric effects or the high, um, but they also can slow breathing, alter mood, cause constipation, that sort of thing. Uh, risk factors, there's pretty much a individual and environmental risk factors when we talk about, um, about uh, prescription drugs and opioids. 50% um, are predisposed, it's genetic. 50% of people are predisposed. Okay, so that's a really big individual risk factor. Okay, so when you talk about addiction, um, it might have been my choice to use Oxycontin the first time, but what if I'm predisposed genetically? That's not my choice. Okay, so if that continues to happen, what if I suffered trauma? What if I was given prescription drugs because I hurt my ankle and then I'm addicted to it um, because the doctor gave me a six month supply? Okay, so those aren't always choices. Maybe the first time, yeah, maybe not. Predisposed to addiction? Uh, yeah, yeah, genetically. Okay. Um, environmentally, we're talking about um, some things that we've already discussed, trauma related things. Um, parents' use and attitudes, your peer influences, uh, community attitudes. Uh, one thing we really want to focus on with kids is um, um, early onset. Okay, so what age are they starting to use uh, drugs and alcohol, prescription drugs, what, or abusing? Okay, and we want to decrease or increase that age. So if they're starting on average at 13 years old, that has to come up, that has to come up. So we need to focus on that and focus on uh, ease of availability ease of availability, okay, and are they available in, in the environment, are they available in school, that sort of thing. Um, so heroin, um, basically um, all opioids are depressant, uh, they dull pain and uh, impair cognition. So heroin can be distributed as uh, white powder, brown powder. This is a picture of black tar heroin. And black tar heroin came to Denver and Colorado Springs and other places out west of the Mississippi. Um, and basically, if, you ever, if, if you're interested in stuff like this, read the book Dreamland, okay? If you ever read Dreamland, it's an amazing book, but it talks about uh, pharmacy companies, it talks about um, the distribution channels and the pill mills, the doctors that had licenses suspended, but just opened up the pill mills. Um, it's a great book and a great read. It talks about uh, drug trafficking and how heroin has came into the, came into the United States. But uh, a lot of white powder heroin is east of the Mississippi. No, I, I'm assuming it may be easier to traffic that way. But um, these cartels from Mexico that came in originally, um, they stayed away from the big cities. So this is in the book Dreamland. They stayed away from uh, the really like New York City, Detroit. And they focused on those middle cities that didn't have a lot of gang issues because they opened what um, Dreamland author Sam Kianis, if I pronounce it correctly, um, said was like a pizza delivery driver system. So in other words, they would buy these modest cars, they would have black tar heroin in them, and they would have people page them and almost deliver them to deliver the black tar heroin to, to people. Um, so this came to Denver because it's cheaper, it's easy to make, but why it's not as popular now is because it's hard to mix different things into it. So fentanyl, it's hard to mix that into black tar heroin. So west of the Mississippi now, we're starting to see a lot more fentanyl. It's definitely here in Jefferson County. Car fentanyl, we're hearing it's in Denver. We're hearing it. Um, but we don't have a lot of, of evidence of it being in Jefferson County. Um, the nod, uh, uh, anybody remember the movie The Wizard of Oz? Yeah, so, um, uh, the Wicked Witch of the West made, um, before they got to the Emerald City, Dorothy and everybody go through an opioid field, a poppy field, okay? Um, because she said it would put them to sleep. This is 1939, okay? <laughs> she said it would put them to sleep, okay? And then in the movie, it puts them to, to sleep or, or starts to at least. But that's um, also when you see somebody on heroin or fentanyl, it's called the nod. So they'll start to doze off, so they go in between unconsciousness and being awake. So there was somebody, and again, stigma, put on Facebook a video of an employee working at like a fast food restaurant. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it, but she's working and she's wiping off a table, and then she just nods off, and then she comes back, and she goes to the next table, and she nods off. She could have been tired. Probably not, okay? But they were laughing and making fun of her because of this situation. But it's not, it's something that's pretty um, popular with um, the people who, who use heroin and fentanyl. Um, 
I didn't know this, but I thought this was interesting. So uh, the Good Witch uh, made it snow, and that woke up or snapped them out of their sleep. And um, this, again, this was 1939, and it's apparently back then, um, <clears throat> what it's supposed to or what it's supposed to be a figure of is, is, is that cocaine. Because back in 1939, cocaine was legal. And cocaine was supposed to, if you took an opioid and you were struggling with that, you take cocaine and, and that'll balance it out. Um, so, um, I think it's just snow. Uh, um, <laughs> um, so, types of opioids here real quick. Um, there are natural opioids um, that come from the opium, the, the plant, um, morphine and codeine. And then there are semi-synthetic and full synthetic opioids. And I just mentioned that because if we look at fully synthetic opioids, they're man-made. We're talking fentanyl, um, carfentanyl, we're talking methadone, those sorts of things. Um, so, um, it's changed in the past 10 years, obviously, um, what type of opioids we're, we're going from. Just like marijuana, THC levels in marijuana 30 years ago are a lot different than they are right now. Uh, so fentanyl, uh, different names for fentanyl are Apache, China Girl, China White, Dance Fever, Friend, Goodfellow, Jackpot, Murder 8, TMT, and Tango and Cash. So those are some strange names for fentanyl that we hear. Um, so if you're prescribed fentanyl, basically it's administered an injection, transdermal patch is in the most popular in lozenges. Okay, but if it's made in a lab, if it's illegal, if it's synthetic, typically they make it so you can swallow, snort, or inject. They're actually fentanyl pills that look exactly like Oxycontin. Okay, they have the, the uh, Purdue Farmer symbol on it, they have the milligrams, it's, it's fentanyl. Okay. But why fentanyl? Because fentanyl is killing people. Why are dealers uh, putting fentanyl in, into um, heroin, into cocaine, into meth? Um, any ideas or thoughts why they might be doing that? Yeah, it can, can definitely increase tolerance. Um, Isn't it cheaper? Cheaper. It's very fast acting. Very fast acting. Yeah, so um, as we have a map here later, but God, wait, I'll show, show it to you then. But it's cheaper and it spreads out the heroin. So fentanyl is cheap, it's made in labs. Um, it goes to a dealer, they cut it with fentanyl, okay? Then it goes to another dealer in the next county. They cut it with fentanyl, they're all taking their piece, they're all taking their piece. So as it goes along, it might get um, weaker with fentanyl, um, they might add more fentanyl. Okay, so it just kind of depends really on where we're at. But, um, so fentanyl is 5,100 times more, more potent uh, than morphine, okay? Uh, carfentanyl is 100 times more potent than fentanyl. And carfentanyl is an animal tranquilizer, typically an elephant tra tranquilizer. Okay, so very strong, very potent. Um, People who overdose on fentanyl, if they're given naloxone, they typically need multiple doses of, of naloxone in order to, to revive. Okay, so just some uh, withdrawal symptoms here from um, heroin and, and other opioids, fentanyl. Um, extremely uncomfortable, painful, muscle pain, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, sweating, abdominal pain, cramping, rapid heartbeat, insomnia, tremors, anxiety. Okay, so we've all experienced probably one of those. Anxiety, yeah, I have anxiety sometimes. Um, um, abdominal pain, yeah, absolutely. But imagine all together. Imagine experiencing those symptoms all together. Anxiety, tremors. Um, people, when they're struggling with an addiction, they will do whatever they possibly can to avoid this, okay? It's not necessarily about the high. It's not about getting high. Oh, I need to take some heroin to get high. No, I'm gonna take heroin to avoid that. Okay, that's, that takes priority over everything in their life when they're experiencing withdrawal symptoms. How can they, they get their next fix to get them how to withdraw? Okay. Narcan parties, have you heard of Narcan parties? They don't happen. They don't happen. Why would somebody come? Because when you, when you take Narcan, um, it can put you into a withdrawal because you're bumping the opioids <laughs> off the receptors. That's exactly what they're trying to avoid. <clears throat> Taking Narcan to do that, they, they're, they're, Narcan parties, are, are just a myth that, was, that were created. Um, so you can see just, uh, that's a dime, I believe. Um, uh, an overdose of car, a lethal dose of carfentanil on the right, uh, fentanyl in the middle, and heroin. Heroin's 10 to 12 milligrams. Um, again, it depends. 
you know, we don't know. Everyone's different, so we're not quite sure how, how people are going to, who's going to get addicted, who's not going to get addicted, okay? Um, don't tell my parents, but I smoked cigarettes in college uh, a little bit here and there, okay? Um, I remember buying a pack of cigarettes one time in college, maybe just one time. But um, I, never, I never became addicted to them at all. I, I have friends now who still smoke, and I sit there, and, and at the time, I'm like, oh, man, I didn't know anything about it. But now I sit back and I'm like, why am I? doing what they were doing, but I never, ever, once I, I got graduated college, thought about, hey, let's go um, buy a pack of smokes. Never ever crossed my mind at all. I don't remember ever touching one after that. So we never know how it's going to affect um, individually. We never know how it's going to affect. And we know that youth, kids' brains don't fully develop until they're age 25. So um, if they're smoking their mom's marijuana, because it's healthy, that's what everyone says, um, it's affecting the brain, it's changing those receptors in the brain. But you can see um, just what a small dose of carfentanil, small dose of fentanyl can do. Um, we talked a little bit about that, uh, but the effects, I mean, what can happen if you overdose on heroin fentanyl? And we're talking unconsciousness, coma, death. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about treatment here and different options that are available. So again, um, MAT, MAT, medicated assisted treatment, or we just want to really be great if we could just call it treatment. So um, whenever we say medicated assisted treatment, we always hear, oh, methadone, that's one drug for another. You're just substituting. So it's going to take me to Vivitrol to talk about first. So does anybody know anything about Vivitrol at all? Injectable for, for alcohol. Yeah. Injectable for alcohol, also for opioids. But it's been around for a long time for alcohol. Um, anything else? So um, Vivitrol is an antagonist. So I showed you that picture with the opiates attached to the receptors on the brain. What happens is you, if you get a shot of Vivitrol, it'll go bump off those opioids and it'll attach, excuse me, that's something else. It'll go, it'll attach themselves to those receptors. Why Vivitrol is different than the other medicated sister treatment is you have to detox from opioids before you can take uh, Vivitrol. Okay, so you have to detox, so it's a difference. But, um, it prevents a euphoria or high, so Vivitrol attaches those receptors. If somebody injects heroin, it's just bouncing off that Vivitrol. It's not attaching to the receptors, okay? So there's no withdrawal symptoms. They try and manage as, as well as they can in detox. There's no withdrawal symptoms, and then there's no desire for that because Vivitrol is blocking those receptors. It's already attached to them, okay? It's a favorite in the criminal justice system, okay? Why do you think the criminal justice system loves Vivitrol? Because it prevents relapse for like what thirty days after almost. Yeah, and it works on alcohol too. So. Yeah, yeah, it works on both. Um, it's good for thirty days. Okay. Um, Only one time a month. Mm. Easy to administer. Easy to administer. Um, yeah. So can't use it. And then, what's the perception out there? Um, um, that Vivitrol. Not substituting one drug for another. Okay, so here's the Vivitrol is a fantastic drug. A couple problems with it Th over $1,000 per shot. Okay, um, once every 30 days, so once a month. But also, um, um, you have to risk or you have to um, detox. So you have to detox again, we talk about maybe five, 10 days, depending on an individual. So uh, Vivitrol is in our jail here in Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Sh Sheriff's Sheriff. Wow. At our event a couple weeks ago, he said, no shame, no blame. He stood up at the podium and said, we are about no shame and no blame. Fantastic message he's sending, and our sheriff's department is sending. They have Vivitrol in their jail now, but they're not seeing many people using Vivitrol because you have to detox. Sorry. And then you have to get set up on a schedule. So in other words, they maybe start their detox, and then they're leaving the jail. So they might only be in for two weeks. So it's difficult, but here's the other thing. Here's what happens with Vivitrol. You have a high uh, chance of overdose and death if, if you start a Vivitrol program for that reason. So let's say I'm in jail, I want Vivitrol, I detox. Um, maybe I do take my first shot of Vivitrol. Maybe I don't get to it. I leave, I go get heroin. I'm using that same dose of heroin that I was using before I was in jail and before I detoxed. I take that same dose, my tolerance isn't there, I overdose and I die. So there's a high chance of overdose for people who run Vivitrol. I'm not saying it's not bad, it's really not bad, but what we really need to make sure that we're doing is, is that everybody gets assessed and screened and given the best option for treatment. 
Uh, next one down is suboxone. So suboxone is a partial agonist, so it partially blocks the receptors. So if Vivitrol completely blocks receptors, um, suboxone partially blocks the receptors, okay? So what does that mean? Any ideas? What do you think? Suboxone, can it be abused? Yeah. Is there a chance of taking heroin and overdosing? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, suboxone relieves uh, withdrawal symptoms. Um, it also includes naloxone. So there's actually naloxone in suboxone to help prevent that abuse. Um, much less expensive, $100 to $800 a month, um, depending what your insurance covers, what your office includes in that treatment. Uh, suboxone, you take a couple times a week. And now they have these dissolved dissolvable strips you put underneath your tongue and you can take it. Um, it can be diverted, can be sold on the street, so again, it's a uh, criminal justice system looks at that side. It. You can't get people to box it if they might, might um, sell it on the streets. Uh, the training for it is a huge barrier, so it's a eight hour training. Doctors um, have to sit through that training and then they're limited in the first year. They, they can only treat 35 patients with Suboxone. So what do doctors say? We're losing money on this. In year two, if they treated 35, they can be bumped up to 100. If they show that they can do 100 patients, then the most they can have is 275. So it's a 35, 100, 275 rule. You know, you know, named it, but that's the rule. But it's a federal guideline and policy, and it's a huge, huge barrier. I'll tell you how many suboxone doctors we have here in a second in Jefferson County. And then there's methadone. Uh, these three are evidence-based treatment evidence-based, okay? There's so much data behind methadone, uh, suboxone, and vivitrol. Suboxone and vivitrol, not as much data, but methadone, a ton of data, saying the effectiveness of, of how um, it's, it's used and how it helps. Uh, so it's an agonist, so it does not attach or block the receptors. Um, it works best uh, when used for long periods of time, okay? And um, it, it maintains safe levels of opioids in the system. It's very inexpensive, 10 to $20 a day, and that includes the cost that the doctor's offices or the methadone clinics would use to administer that. So if we're talking just methadone, it's a few dollars a day. When you say long periods of time, how long is Well, if you, talk, if you talk to somebody at the methadone clinic, they'll sit there and say, it's all individual, it depends. Um, <laughs> I know somebody back in Pennsylvania before I left, they were on methadone for two and a half years. Um, they, he lost his family, lost his kids, lost his job, lost everything. Um, got in, into um, treatment, so on methadone, and I forget before I was leaving, um, he said something to me, we were talking one day, and he said, um, I'm thinking about getting off methadone. <coughs> he stabilized, was he dependent on it? Maybe, maybe. But he got a job in construction, he's able to visit his kids a couple weekends a month, um, he's getting his life back. Nobody complains when somebody quits tobacco and they sit there and they're like, oh, I'm gonna be on a nicotine patch. I'm gonna take that lozenge for six months, not three. Just do it, just do it. So it depends, but the, the methadone clinic will say, maybe they look at people after six months and say, okay, do we wanna to start to taper down? Some people are ready to start to taper down a little bit off of methadone somewhere. So it just depends, individual. Um, but again, it's well-researched. Um, uh, methadone you do have to take daily. Okay, so that's a barrier. Um, but you do take it daily. Methadone clinics open super early, okay? And this guy who took methadone in Pennsylvania, I, I mean, they were open at 5 a.m. and I couldn't figure out why they opened so early. Um, but he was embarrassed to go. So he would start his day, he would go to the methadone clinic and be the first person in line. And then after you go through certain levels, you could get methadone take home for a week. Then you could take it home after a few more months uh, for a month. You could get a 30 or 28 day supply to take home. So he was at that point. But for a while, he would go to the methadone clinic, be the first one there at 5 a.m. because he was just embarrassed to, to be outside in that parking lot. Again, stigma associated with those clinics. Does insurance cover it? Yeah, all of them. All of them. So it depends. Um, you know, it depends, obviously, with private insurance. Um, and then there's some discussion here in Colorado's behind with Medicaid coverage and treatment and, and MATs, but it's kind of. Find out like where they are and 
or they were doing that. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure it's that's like what happens. a very happens. sophisticated yeah. way to keep people in to the business. Um, when we talk about, I really like this slide because it talks about addiction and then if you were prescribed opioid agonist like a methadone or suboxone, um, you know, what happens from addiction and what's possible to uh, dependency. Um, so a lot of people are dependent on, on methadone. A lot of people are dependent on, on suboxone. That's okay as long as it's not being abused. And a lot of times what comes with this treatment, it's not just necessarily, here's your methadone, take care. There are treatment behavioral therapies that individuals go through. And that's why it's really important to um, make sure that people are being attached to services. So as someone's going in the methadone clinic, we've talked to the methadone clinic, what they're really looking at doing is peer specialists. So they want people in recovery to help. So they want uh, community peer specialists that can go to um, a park Drew and I were talking earlier, Colfax Avenue, where people are knowingly using and abusing, and go there and try and talk to them about treatment. Um, but they also want peer specialists in the facility because when people are starting their methadone uh, treatment, <coughs> and it's connecting them to other resources. Cause what do we, we talked about anxiety, depression, we talked about suffering, what else is going on? We can give them methadone to help with withdrawal and their opioid addiction, but what else is happening? It's very, very important that we connect these people um, with other options and treatment. And the most important thing is a normal life, <clears throat> just back to whatever that normal life may be. That person in Pennsylvania who's on methadone for two years, a normal life for him is he's had a job, he didn't miss a day of work in a year, and he's seen his kids again. That's, that's beautiful for him, that's his, his, he's getting his normal life back. Um, so who, who gets a, a addicted? So one thing that we need to really take is take a step back and, and realize that only 8% of the people given prescription meds become addicted. Okay, it's a really, really small percentage. Up to 26% are misusing or abusing. Okay, so 75% or more people are taking their prescription as prescribed. Um, they're fine, they can handle the opioids. So again, it's just a small percentage, 8% that do become addicted. Oops. Sorry. Um, so, um, and that came from, that slide came from uh, NIDA, um, which is a great resource if anybody's interested in learning more information. Um, and then rural addiction. So we talk about, uh, again, if somebody relapses from uh, tobacco cessation, so if somebody's smoking cigarettes, they relapse and have a couple of cigarettes, what, what do we tell them to do? It's okay. It's okay. It's no big deal. You know, stay with your nicotine patch, or if you got off of it, get back on it whatever. Um, we want to do the same thing with people who might relapse. So we say relapse is part of treatment. Relapse is part of treatment. So if you're on methadone, if you're on suboxone, if you're in abstinence based, if you're in, in your relapse, it's part of treatment, okay? Um, so we just want to keep all, um, continuously say it as much as we can. Um, relapse rates from drug addiction and other chronic illnesses are pretty much similar. Okay. Um, Narcan, naloxone, so when people leave treatment, when people leave the jail, our Points Western Services program here, um, not only do we talk to people about treatment and, and what that might look like and what kind of treatment they're interested in, but we give them a Narcan kit too, okay? Um, these are different types of Narcan. This is the nasal spray, S stick it up the nose, squirt it, bang, done, okay? And you get a couple doses, of uh, four milligrams, in each kit. Okay. Um, it's about $125. So it's expensive. Insurance covers it. So it's, it's readily available. Um, and we believe naloxone enables breathing. It's what it enables. It's, it's not, we don't feel it's, it's, there are no Narcan parties. Okay. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Okay. So um, the U.S. Surgeon General, I was at a conference last April, and the U.S. US Surgeon General was there, and he said Narcan for, for everyone. And they're doing whatever they can to push this out to get it to um, anyone. And you can go into a pharmacy and, and get naloxone. There's a standing order. You don't need a prescription. So nationally, there, and Colorado State Attorney General adopted it. Um, so you can walk into any pharmacy and say, hey, um, I need Narcan. Um, a lot of pharmacies will have it right there on the spot. Some might order it. Okay. So you want to know who has naloxone. Um, you can go to stoptheclock.org. You can type in a zip code, and it'll pop up all the pharmacies in your area that carry naloxone. 
Um, so you see them flagged on the map, but they're also listed underneath here. I didn't capture that, but it also lists underneath here. And that's just Lakewood in Lakewood. So Jefferson County, there are plenty of pharmacies that, that carry naloxone. So stoptheclock.org, and you can see um, where, to, where to get naloxone. Okay, so um, just a couple things I want to talk on here before we uh, finish up, and, and just to let you know what's happening in Jefferson County. Um, so we have a grant from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and we do provider education training, and we have coalition building, so we're bringing people together to talk about uh, opioid prevention, intervention, treatment, recovery, sober living, what that looks like. We have these people at the table. We meet on a monthly basis, and we're working on some different things. Um, so before I get into more detail, this is the map I was talking about. So 2002 to 2014, and here's what I just learned from the Colorado Consortium for Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention. Um, this is 2002, overdose deaths rate by county, darker the color, the more overdose deaths. You can see uh, 2014, that's a 500% increase in, in across the state of Colorado in overdose deaths. Um, but I guess, I'm, I'm new to Colorado, so I might be off here a little bit, but I-25 corridor, comes up here. Okay, there are different regions through the I-25 corridor. When I say regions, I'm talking about dealers, I'm talking about um, the um, the cartels that come through. So, why is it why are the southern counties higher uh, overdose death rates? Well, they're rural. Uh, typically, probably the number one reason they're rural. Um, but also, we we think that the fentanyl is stronger in the southern part of the state because obviously dealers are coming up that I-25 corridor. As they go to their other region, the dealer cuts it. So they'll cut that fat, they'll cut that heroin, and then they'll cut it again, and then they'll cut it again. Um, so Northeast Colorado is pretty rural too. You can see some up here um, that have a higher dose of death rate. So that's what the DEA is thinking that sometimes the, the heroin just constantly gets cut, get cut, get cut, get cut. So it, 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 it um, gets weaker as it goes up uh, the corridor. Um, but then if somebody decides they want to add fentanyl to it, then again, you know, we're, we're back and you never know what you're getting. Oops, that's not center. Um, so um, some other Jefferson County uh, data. In overdoses, uh, Jefferson County was fourth in 2016. 2017 has not come out yet for specific counties. Uh, you can see in 2001 there were 44 fatal overdoses in Jefferson County. Um, just some other stats, um, overdose deaths in Colorado, uh, two, or 959 in 2017, 912 in 2016, and in 2016 there were 627 motor vehicle accidents, okay? Uh, 2015, 2016 was the first time that overdose deaths surpassed motor vehicle accidents. Uh, the mortality rate is 16.7 um, overdose deaths per 1,000 people in 2017 in Jefferson County. And that's an increase of 83%. Um, so why is this important? Because we hear about overdose deaths, but um, for every one prescription or illicit opioid overdose deaths in 2015, there was other things on the right that occurred. Um, 18 people with a substance use disorder, uh, 62 had a substance use disorder, including prescription drugs, involving prescription drugs, misuse prescriptions, and who were given prescription opioids. So, you know, these are things on the right here that we constantly have to monitor because are they going over here? Are they becoming an overdose? Um, we can probably say for certain that most of the overdose and the increase are due to synthetic opioids and fentanyl that are, are not just in, in heroin, but getting laced into cocaine, meth, everything really. So, um, just a couple other stats here. Um, why is this important for Jefferson County? Because the highest proportion of our residents are age 45 through 64, followed by 20 to 44. 20 to 44 have the highest rate of overdose deaths. Um, and then we had the highest number of residents age 65 and older per the 2010 census. Why is that important? Because the second one here, um, ages 55 or older, 27% received five or more opioid prescriptions in a year. 24% received two or three prescriptions for in a year of an opioid for people age 55 or over. That's a lot of prescriptions of opioids for that age range, okay? So our population is something that we need to keep an eye on as we have a, an older population. Are they being prescribed that many opioids over the course of a year? And then another thing that's a problem, um, not necessarily a problem, but with, with this issue it kind of is, prescribers are increased in a year from 14.9 to 15.2, and then pharmacies, 883 pharmacies 
in 2016, we had 905, 905 pharmacies. That, that includes all the all the WalMarts or all the King Supers, and then also the unique individual um, mom and pop type pharmacies. Um, with all that being said, we have 35 Suboxone doctors, 35, and we believe that not all of them are even prescribing or taking patients. <coughs> so. Um, we only have 35 Suboxone doctors, but we have 905 pharmacies. We have over 15,000 prescribers. Too many barriers to prescribe to prescribe Suboxone, and hopefully that'll change. But, um, 2017 uh, coroner data, you can see uh, um, the red line, heroin deaths, uh, fentanyl deaths from 2016 to 2017. Um, what's going down, prescription medication deaths, and then any opiate present. So um, those uh, that fluctuates, because again, there's typically somebody who overdoses from heroin and fentanyl, they have three, four, or five different drugs in their system. So coroner data, collecting that, being consistent with it, toxicology reports, it's really inconsistent. Heroin overdose deaths are probably underreported across the nation. Um, so we've heard of coroners and families coming in and saying, hey, please listen, please see. It was a heart attack, right? It was a heart attack. Well, the heroin caused that, but the coroner might label it a heart attack as causing death. Um, and again, it's a stigma part of it. But also, some coroners just don't, don't necessarily report all the substances that are used. So, um, so here's Jefferson County. Um, just wanted to show you just some things that we're working on. Um, this is the Colorado Consortium, this whole model right here. Uh, so they're the statewide group, Colorado Consortium for Prescription, Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention, and um, they have all these work groups across the state. And um, Jefferson County, I highlighted what we're doing in red. So we're getting there. We're getting there. We started at this in January. We have our big steering committee. We have our provider education work group, and then we have our harm reduction group that focuses on, like our Points West advisory group that focuses on Narcan distribution and, and what that looks like. Um, so we're getting there a bit. Um, Education, we had an education program for prescribers in May. Um, all those prescribers we have in, in Jefferson County, we have 51 people at our training um, to talk about prescribing guidelines. But in physicians and prescribers' defense, they're getting hammered for this and blamed. They have fatigue, and they aren't necessarily the folks that need to be blamed. Um, I haven't heard it in Colorado, but in my old state of Pennsylvania, they just arrested recently four doctors who are pill mill doctors. Still going on. Um, but we haven't heard about it in Colorado, which is good. Um, that's a consortium model I already showed you. Uh, just some other initiatives that are happening across the state. I thought this is uh, pretty impressive. Um, uh, the Prescription Drug Take Back Day, twice a year, <coughs> April, and then next one is in October. We had all these police departments participate. They collected in four hours on a Saturday, April 27, a total of 1,639 prescription pills. Okay. Um, so that's a ton of medicine they collected. And you can see Lakewood Police Department does an amazing job of promoting that. And, and Drew and, and Health Communications helped us promote that um, as much as we possibly can. So um, again, this is four hours during the course of a Saturday afternoon, all those prescription drugs that were collected. And again, we know that kids, oops, 42% um, of kids, a Colorado teens um, say it's easy to get prescription drugs. Okay, where are they getting it? They're stealing it from their parents' medicine cabinets, or mom or dad are giving it to them because they come home from practice one day and say, I hurt my ankle, and they're like, Oh my gosh, I have these opioids. I've been sitting there, I got the socks cotton, been sitting there, and they're letting their kids take because they just don't know any better. So, um, education. Um, Colorado Medicine Take Back locations, you Google that. There's a, a map. We have locations here in Jefferson County, uh, numerous ones where you can go to, even on a weekend, Kaiser Permanent Day. You can go to those on a weekend and drop off. And then we had an indoor Ghost Chef Co event a few weeks ago at the um, <coughs> Course and Avenue building. We did open memorial wall there, which is really a nice display. I don't know if anybody's able to stop by or not, but uh, the wall was, I think, 34 feet long, 8 feet high, and it represents um, 10 people lost to heroin and prescription opioid deaths. So there are pill bottles on there, and each pill bottle represents 10 people lost. So there are a total of 4,200 pill bottles. Um, and um, Rob Valick from the Colorado Consortium, the director, said if we were to do this wall in 2017, they'd have to add two more panels and put that on there because of the opioid <coughs> overdose deaths here and, and across the nation. Um, so um, 
But uh, just some other things that are happening. Um, obviously, uh, speaking engagement. We want to do whatever we can to reduce stigma, reach out to people in the community, our coalitions and things that we're developing to try and help with this issue as much as possible. Um, so um, I think that's about it. We uh, just came out recently, last year across the nation, of 72,000 overdose deaths, um, which is a high, an all-time <coughs> high across the nation, um, increased from 62,000, I believe, or 61,000 the previous year. So again, fentanyl, that's the big call with those synthetic opioids that are just coming in and cutting into heroin, as I mentioned, meth, cocaine, whatever it is. It may be because it's really cheap to make. So, um, any questions at all? Or Okay. Well, thank you all very much for attending. We appreciate your, your time and your coming. Thank you. Thank you.